Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this union session on COVID-19 and the Earth system. My name is Jessica New, and I'll be giving you a brief introduction to the session. COVID-19 really represents a unique opportunity for Earth system science. And that's because the efforts to stop the spread of COVID-19 represent one of the largest, but also best observed abrupt changes to anthropogenic forcing of atmospheric composition and climate of the modern era. In April of 2020, the other session co-chairs and I kicked off a Keck Institute for Space Studies rapid response virtual workshop to identify likely interactions between the pandemic and the Earth system. And we would all like to thank Michelle Judd and Tom Prince for their unwavering support of this workshop and its follow-on activities. This union session highlights research efforts that developed out of that workshop and other studies that seek to understand the effects of changes in emissions and anthropogenic activity on the Earth system. This image represents the sort of overarching view of the COVID-19 pandemic that we came up with out of the workshop. So we start with these big reductions in human activity, and those led to reduced emissions, particularly in the personal transportation sector. Those emissions reductions can be seen either as taking us back in time to previous emission states, or perhaps forward in time to future emission targets. However, because those um, uh, emissions changes happen so abruptly, we can actually observe the air quality and carbon cycle response to those emissions changes. And this helps us to understand how to then effectively mitigate air pollution and climate change in the future. In this session, we will hear from Kelly Stokes and Josh Loughner uh, about changes in human activity associated with government lockdown measures around the world. Mm -hmm. These are satellite images of night, nighttime lights from Wuhan, China from before and after the government lockdown there. And this is the change in vehicle miles traveled in the US between January and February of 2020 and March and April of 2020 when many stay at home orders were implemented across the US. We will also hear from Kevin Bowman about the effects of these lockdown measures on NOx emissions and air quality globally, and from Alex Turner about reductions in CO2 emissions in the San Francisco Bay Area. These are measurements of NO2 columns over China from the Tropomi satellite instrument in 2019 versus 2020. And these are daily CO2 emissions in the San Francisco Bay Area in 2019 in blue and 2020 in orange. So you can see these large changes in emissions are evident from the observation. Now, when we look at these emissions changes, we can think about how far back in time the pandemic has taken us. For CO2, uh, the, the drop in emissions associated with COVID-19 took us back to about 2011 emissions levels. For NOx, went all the way back to about 1999 in terms of global NOx emissions. But of course, because NOx is short-lived, it makes more sense to think about it regionally. So over here, we have a map of this COVID-19 equivalent NOx emission year by country. So for countries where emissions have been increasing in recent years, we can think of them as going back in time. So for example, Brazil went back to about 2008 emission levels. For countries where emissions have been increasing with, uh, sorry, have been decreasing with time in recent years though, it makes more sense to think about how far into the future we will need to go before we get to the COVID-19 emission levels. So for the US and Europe where NOx emissions declines have been relatively slow in recent years, we don't expect to actually reach the COVID-19 type levels until 2030 or so. In China, however, NOx emissions reductions have been very aggressive recently. And so there they might actually reach COVID-19 uh, emissions levels in about 2024. Now, methane represents really a big question in terms of the effects of the pandemic on methane emissions, and we don't know what those effects might have been. But we get to hear from Eric Court in this session about uh, an airborne campaign that was spun up to try to understand the effect of the pandemic and the associated uh, stay-at-home measures on methane sources. So these are air airborne images of methane plumes in Southern California from before the pandemic. And so uh, this airborne campaign has been reflying these California methane sources, including from the energy sector, agriculture, and landfills. And so we'll learn about how those emissions may have changed as a result of the stay-at-home measures. 
In terms of the Earth system response to these emission changes, uh, Kelly Barsanti will be talking about the importance of accounting for the role of meteorology in the air quality of the LA basin during the pandemic. And Dave Schemmel will be discussing the reasons behind the very small changes in atmospheric CO2 concentrations that we see. The black lines in this figure show the 2020 uh, NO2, ozone, and PM2.5 in the LA basin as compared to the climatology, which is in green. But these background colors represent the 2020 temperature anomalies relative to the climatology. And Kelly will be giving more detail about those. Uh, this plot shows the atmospheric CO2 concentrations at Garmisch, Germany. And here we see the very small difference between a business as usual scenario in red and the COVID-19 emissions scenario in orange in terms of atmospheric CO2 concentrations. Now, finally, Paul Winberg will discuss how we can apply the knowledge we've gained uh, from the pandemic to defining effective strategies for mitigating air pollution and climate change. The good news is that emerging technologies should make it possible to do so without the sort of immense personal sacrifice that we've all experienced during the pandemic. So thank you for your time, and I hope that you enjoy the session. Hi, I'm Eleanor Stokes. I'm the science PI of the NASA Black Marble product. And I'm also a scientist at USRA's Earth from Space Institute. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about what our team has been up to this season. Uh, we got funded by the RRNES call from NASA and have been looking at urban activity changes uh, from COVID-19 restrictions. So I wanted to start off by giving you a little background of the Black Marble product in case you're not familiar with the data. The Black Marble is a really special data set because it's one of the few that NASA produces that primarily captures us and our activities. Whereas the Blue Marble has tracked the seasonal changes to wetlands and ice caps and the leaf on and leaf off rhythms of forests, and sometimes even the impact of humans on these natural land systems, in the Black Marble we see our dynamic earth at night. All of those natural land systems fade into the background and front and center are the urban settlements and the human activities within them. We've had night lights data since the 1970s and digitally since the 90s in DMSP OLS, but that data set came with lots of challenges for studying human activities. The spatial resolution was coarse, the radiometric resolution was coarse, so the centers of urban areas were saturated like Cairo here. Um, and it wasn't until two 2012, which was my first year working at NASA Goddard, that we started getting data from Veer's day-night band. And Veer's had notable improvements in both the spatial resolution and the saturation problem, and it also had onboard calibration, which meant we can create a stable daily time series. Of course, when Veer's DMB captures all sources of light, not just urban areas, there's problems with that. You can see in this image moonlight reflecting off of the desert. So our team set about trying to remove these natural aberrations, not just from moonlight, but from air glow, from changes in the surface reflectance, from snowstorms, uh, from tree canopies that block the light that's emitted from street lamps, and etc. And the end result was the production of the black marble product, VNP 46A2 which is now available for downloading from the LADS DAC since August. And this graph shows production progress as of this week. And you can see it's slowly making progress with the most complete part of the time series at the beginning in 2012 and continuing through to about the middle of 2018 so far. So now we're using this data to look at the response of urban areas to COVID restrictions across the Middle East. Specifically, we were motivated early on when COVID-19 hit to try to see if we could map the impacts of restrictions within and across urban areas using this data set. There's a couple of existing data sets that look at changes in urban activity through the lens of mobility, uh, most notably Google and Apple mobility data. And these data sets are derived from cell phone data and they strikingly show how in some cities trips to workplaces and restaurants and entertainment areas have screeched to a halt during the pandemic. Nightlight's data captures a slightly different mechanism. We're not 
capturing individual trip data. And certainly we can't attribute uh, where people are going, but we are capturing business closures and we're capturing a lack of headlights on roads. Um, and what we do have over Google and Apple mobility data sets is coverage in traditionally data scarce areas of the world. So this is a map of the countries in our study. The ones in gray are countries that have no subnational COVID case data. The ones without stripes have no subnational Google data available. And even in the orange counties or the striped uh, countries, we're usually talking about sparse data, ones that um, focus primarily on the biggest cities. And obviously COVID-19 is not only affecting the global north or the big cities, and so it's exactly these places that have no other data where nightlights can be so useful for understanding whether physical distancing is occurring in response to restrictions in place. It's not entirely straightforward, though, to try to parse out the COVID signal from nightlights, especially in the Middle East. And I can show you why looking at Amman, Jordan. This is Amman's nightlight record for the 30 days before, during, and after Ramadan for each year since 2015. It's not a continuous record. Um, it's just showing you the same part of the lunar calendar for five years. As you can see though, it's a very dynamic time series. Uh, first, we have the long-term trend from Amman's urbanization. So Amman grew by 300,000 people in the last five years, which is a change which occurred concurrently with land changes and infrastructure changes. On top of this, we have the seasonal change in radiance from Ramadan. Uh, this is a very striking um, change, sometimes adding, you know, 20% to the signal. And at the same time, uh, in 2020, we have this abrupt disruption in COVID on top of these more predictable dynamics. So it can be hard to disentangle the three, uh, especially when the dynamics are interrelated. So COVID impacts not only how much urban activity generally is happening, but also how people are celebrating Ramadan. So while our work with these time series is very much ongoing, I can give you a sneak peek um, into some of our initial results. And the first takeaway is that once we've detrended and de-seasonalized the time series, we find that disturbance detection techniques can identify the new COVID restrictions when they're put into place quite well. So on the left here is a plot of urban areas in Saudi Arabia. The little squares indicate when a, a BFAST detection algorithm identified a disturbance in the time series. And the two periods highlighted in blue are when nationwide curfews were put in place. So the first one on March 24th, preceded by progressive business and school closures, and then the curfews were eased in late April in preparation for Ramadan. And then again in early May, Saudi Arabia announced a reinstatement of tighter curfews using military police and steep fines. So the algorithm uses nightlights and detects these disturbances quite well and the timing of them across cities. The second takeaway is that we can also see recovery. So the plot on the right contrasts Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, on top with Mecca. And both had lockdowns imposed in mid-March. And you can see the decrease in lights in the, in the line plot um, that occurred uh, from those measures. However, the city of Mecca remained under a 24-hour curfew until after Ramadan, whereas Jeddah's curfew was lifted. And you can see also that, how the two time series start diverging in April in the 1st of April. Um, the third takeaway is that nightlights does not mimic the activity patterns we see from mobility everywhere, and we're not quite sure why. On top are Google retail and workplace data that are corresponding with black marble data, and they're all standardized so their ranges overlap. And while in most places the nightlight patterns are very similar to the Google data, we also have outliers. So, for example, Tel Aviv, Israel or Tarsus, Turkey 
And you can see that the period from mid-April to mid-May, Ramadan, is much better captured in the Nightlights data than in the Google data. And this is partly because Google data is primarily looking at the time when uh, the daytime hours, whereas our Nightlights data is obviously captured you know, in the middle of the night when uh, Ramadan is specifically celebrated. On the country scale, these differences are magnified, especially in places of conflict or instability. So look at Iraq, which has struggled with a, a deficit of the electric grid and has really sporadic night lights records because of its blackouts. Um, also, the electric infrastructure in Yemen and Libya, which have been in ongoing conflicts uh, this and last year, diverges from the cell phone data. So. This sort of gives us a hint of when night lights would be a useful proxy for the kind of activity that we're interested in looking at for COVID-19. I want to end this talk with a big picture idea of where we're headed with this work. So far, the results we've gotten have presented us with as many questions as they have answers. So we hope to combine the night light series with ancillary data to start answering why we see big differences and variations in cities that are under the same restrictions. We also hope to look within cities at where the decreases in night lights are most severe, hot spots of COVID impacts, um, and validate those decreases with commercial data sets that are just coming online. And finally, we think a lot can be gained by expanding this analysis and the data we're producing to other geographic regions. So we're hoping to provide COVID-specific night lights metrics across cities to the public sometime next season. So be on the lookout for that. And if you have interest in more of the work that our team has been doing, please come to some of our other presentations this week at AGU. Uh, we'd be glad to see your Zoom name there. Thanks so much. All right, good. Hello, everyone. My name is Josh Lochner, and today I'm going to be telling you about a data portal that we've put together to help everyone find uh, information that will help understand the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the atmosphere. Before I dive in, I'd like to thank my co-authors, Bart, Shell, and Dan, for helping me really flesh out what kind of data we should be looking for and how to present it to everyone, and Irina, who's done a really spectacular job building the portal itself. So the reason we started working on this goes back to the fact that in order to really understand how the changes in human activity due to the pandemic affect the atmosphere, we need to pull in more than just atmospheric data. And Noah Diffenbaugh and his colleagues said this really well in their paper earlier this year, pointing out that there's a whole wealth of data that we're not traditionally used to using, such as cell phone GPS or social media. But one of the challenges in using that is that one, we just have to find it, and this is data that we don't necessarily know where to look for. And it's also in a bunch of different formats. And so they proposed that an open public repository, which both collected this data in one place and put it in a standardized format, would be really valuable for research both now and into the future. And this is something that we completely agree with. But there's challenges not only as far as making the data usable for scientists, but in addressing some legal concerns that emerge from distributing other people's data. So on the scientific side, these are problems that we're used to dealing with, such as deciding on a standardized file format that's easy for everyone in the community to use and making sure that there's sufficient metadata associated with it so that we understand what the data is telling us and where it's located and so forth. Especially for these sorts of new data sets, just finding them online can be challenging. And as responsible scientists, we wanna make sure that any data set we use is going to be available in perpetuity and is citable. Now the sorts of data that are really valuable for understanding the change in human activity during the pandemic also bring with them a bunch of legal challenges. For instance, a lot of these data sets are actually sold commercially. So if we want to distribute a derived product from them, do we have that right? What kind of terms would we have to agree to with the original data provider? Second, what kind of attribution do we need to assure? 
And this goes beyond just making sure that we acknowledge where the data came from or cite it in our papers. But if the original provider counts the number of downloads to see how much use the data is getting, then if we are providing a download from a separate location, how do we give them that download credit? And third, what kind of liability would you be assuming by building this sort of portal? So for instance, if you wanted to look at a data set derived from health data and the original provider had an error in their code that meant that the data wasn't fully anonymized and we then redistribute that data, are we liable for any privacy violations? So what we've tried to do is come up with a method that lets us really focus on the scientific challenges, but is built in a way that these legal concerns don't arise. What we've done is instead of building a actual repository that holds the data is we've built a web portal that helps you find the original providers of the data. So let's say that you wanted to find traffic data in California. You could visit our portal, look up traffic in California data sets, and then we would provide not the data itself, but a link to the original provider's website, and you would download the data directly from them, which takes care of any liability or attribution concerns. Now, that data, of course, is going to be in whatever format the original provider gives, which is not necessarily ideal for atmospheric science. And so we also provide a Python package that allows you to read that in or convert it to a standardized format locally on your computer or your cloud environment. So what I'd like to do is show an example of how the portal works and can help you find data. And if you want to check it out yourself, the link is here in the top of the, the slide title. So let's say that I wanted to find traffic data in North America. On the left side of the portal here, there is a series of categories and you can select which category or categories of data you're interested in. In this case, I've checked mobility for traffic. And then on the right-hand side, you have options for the spatiotemporal coverage of the data. So for instance, this top slider lets me say that I only want data that's at least resolved by state. I don't want national or global average data. And so I've set the bounds of the slider from infinitely resolved data to state by state data. Below that, I can set what part of the world I'm interested in. So here I want data from North America. And if I wanted to be more precise, I would be able to drill down into countries, states, and counties. I can also set the temporal resolution of the data. So in this case, I want data that is at least resolved by day. I don't want weekly or monthly data. And so again, I set the slider from infinite resolution to day. And I want data that covers the height of reductions due to the pandemic. So I've chosen to require that it needs has temporal coverage between March 1st and June 1st. We've also given options to search by keywords and you get really fine grained control over how you Boolean them together. And then when you apply your filters, the list of data sets at the bottom will be restricted to the ones that match your criteria. And so you can see that we have all the metadata that you are searching on listed along with a couple extra columns. And most importantly, we give you the link to the data set where you can go download the data rather than providing it ourselves. One of the more difficult pieces to explain that I wanted to cover are these columns labeled special one, special two, or special three. And these deal with metadata that varies from data type to data type. So a lot of the data, a lot of the metadata rather in this table at the bottom is gonna be common across all types of data. So any type of data has a temporal resolution or a spatial resolution, that sort of thing. But not all data is measuring concentrations in the atmosphere. So for instance, this is a satellite data set. And before you go and click through and start downloading it, you might wanna know what kind of measurement it is and what species it measures. So what we do is we use these special columns to give you additional information unique to that type of data. In this case, we tell you that it's a total column measurement in the special one column, and then it measures CO2 in the second column. And to know what each of these bubbles refers to, you can hover over them and the pop-up will tell you what this means. In this case, hovering over this one, the pop-up tells me that this is the species measured. As I said, once you download the data, you then have to deal with the fact that it's gonna be in any one of a number of formats. And so we have provided a Python package on GitHub that 
supports reading in all six of these data types into a Python notebook and also converts several of them into a standard NetCDF format. And in a couple of cases, actually helps you download the data. Uh, this is especially for the port data because that has to be actually scraped from a website rather than downloaded as a CSV or other type of file. And so on GitHub, this is the CADA or COVID Atmospheric Ancillary Data Agglomerator Package. For now, you download it directly from GitHub and install it. In the future, we might be able to support a package manager like Conda. Now, one of the challenges that we have is, as you can imagine, this takes a lot of work to find and curate the data sets and then write code to support them. And the five of us don't have infinite time to devote to this. So we're always looking for people who can help us out. And one of the easiest ways you can help us is to let us know about interesting data sets that you think would be valuable to the atmospheric community. And if you do find one, you can visit this link, click on this submit data set button. It will take you to a Google form, which will take you a minute, two at most to fill out. And when you submit it, we'll be alerted to that new data set and we'll review it and add it to the portal. Also, if you're a daft hand at programming in Python and wanna help out expanding the Kata package, then let me know, email me, and I'd be happy to talk with you about how you can contribute there. And that's everything I wanted to cover. I'll just uh, refresh your memory on the links to both the data portal and the GitHub Python package at the top. I'd like to thank Jessica, Dave, and Paul for initiating the study that this project grew out of. Michelle for keeping us organized and on track over the last eight months, the Keck Institute for hosting the study. And if you wanna get in touch with me, you can go to this website and click on the contact tab to find my contact information. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for joining me today to hear about some of the early implications of the COVID-19 shelter in place restrictions, specifically on urban air quality in the Los Angeles basin. The results that I'll be sharing today came out of a COVID-19 virtual study that was initiated by the Keck Institute for Space Studies. The team pictured here was focused on the LA Basin and I want to acknowledge and thank them for the contributions to what I will be showing today. I also want to acknowledge a few of the KISS virtual study facilitators, including Michelle Judd, Jessica New, and David Schimmel. On March 4, 2020, California Governor Newsom declared a state of emergency due to the threat of COVID-19. Shortly after, on March 19, Governor Newsom issued shelter-in-place orders to preserve public health and safety throughout the state. In the weeks that followed, we were flooded with images and headlines such as the one shown here that the pandemic had led to a huge global drop in air pollution. This is true for the Los Angeles Basin as well, as evidenced in this tweet by Reuters on April 5th, 2020. Residents of Los Angeles are enjoying a third straight week of clean air, leading some to wonder if reduced traffic from the city's stay-at-home orders is playing a part. Well, the Twitter sphere erupted and a lot of snarky comments like these followed. At the same time, the scientific community began meeting as virtual study groups, taking measurements when they could, running models and analyzing data. We recognize that any changes in air quality and ultimately the impacts on human health and climate would be heterogeneous. That is, they would be spatially variable and moderated by chemistry and meteorology. The COVID-19 shelter in place restrictions have offered us an opportunity, an unprecedented opportunity to assess our state of understanding. We, collect we collectively have begun using archived data and new measurements and models to test hypotheses about sources and levels of pollutants and their precursors. Here I'll focus on ozone and fine particulate matter or PM 2.5 and we are evaluating our fundamental understanding and our model representation of how changes in emissions and meteorology are driving changes in ozone and PM 2.5. And again, I want to emphasize that we're focused on the LA Basin. So it's useful to start with a historical perspective 
Here I'm showing 50 years of decreasing ozone and ozone precursor concentrations in the basin. The red trace shows the maximum one hour average and the blue trace shows maximum eight hour average. You see this steep decline till the early 2000s. And I do want to point out this leveling of those trends. This is one of the reasons why we're focused on looking at the connections between emissions, chemistry, meteorology, and concentrations of pollutants. We see also on the right, the decreasing trends in the ozone precursor, NOx in yellow, and VOCs in purple. Moving on to some of the observation during the COVID-19 shelter in place, we'll start with a view of the statewide reduction in transportation emissions that were associated with the decrease in vehicle miles traveled. We have the time period from March 4th through June 27th. You can see this maximum reduction in emissions in late March and early April about 30% in diesel particulate matter, about 40% in NOx and volatile organic carbon compounds or reactive organic gases, and about 60% in PM2.5 and CO2. I want to point out that there has been a steady increase in these vehicle emission reductions. That said, we still, for some pollutants, have not returned to baseline levels. We can see evidence of these reductions in transportation and source emissions from the CLARS FTS network on Mount Wilson. This is a typical April mean. This is the time period from 2011 to 2019. You're seeing excess CO2 across the LA basin. This is the April mean in 2020. And what we can see is that CO enhancement in LA is reduced by about 37% in April again, due to these COVID-19 shelter in place restrictions. One of the things that's not shown here is that even though we saw the increase in transportation, vehicle miles traveled, and some increase in transportation emissions, it's noted here that the recovery of CO has been slow um, from May to July, even with this increase. Now we'll start looking at some of the spatial distributions and these changes in emissions. So here we have the monthly average one hour daily maximum in O2. Again, we're comparing to a baseline. In this case, it's 2015 to 2019. And you can see in March and in April, this you know, up to 50% reduction in NO2, again, due to the shelter in place restrictions. I'll point out that in May, particularly in the inland part of the basin, we do see a return to baseline and in some cases an exceedance over baseline, this difference between again, the one hour daily maximum in O2 compared to the baseline. I wanna point out, I forgot to point this out before, but down below you'll see references to other talks that are coming up that have additional details about what I'm presenting here today. Okay, so we can compare and contrast the changes in, in O2 with the changes in ozone. So if you remember, we had those basin-wide decreases in March and April in NO2, but you'll see that we don't necessarily have basin-wide decreases, again, relative to the baseline in ozone. Um, I will point out that this is the eight-hour daily maximum ozone. And in particular, when we start moving into May, You'll notice that though we had largely basin-wide decreases in NO2, particularly on the western side or the coastal side of the basin, here we sort of have widespread increases in the eight-hour daily maximum ozone. And that again is increases relative to the historical baseline for the period of 2015 to 2019. So this prompted us to look a little bit more closely at meteorology. So what I'm showing here, the top panel is one hour daily max NO2. The middle panel is eight hour daily max ozone and the bottom is 24 hour PM 2.5. And what you can see in the NO2 trace, the black trace is 2020. So again, relative to the baseline, which is shown in green, we see this de decrease in emissions again during the March, April time period that is associated with reduced activity, therefore reduced emissions, particularly transportation emissions. Also shown in the middle panel, again, if we focus on this black trace, this is the ozone, we see that 
increase above the baseline that we observed in the spatial distributions in April and May. And we also see here that this is correlated with higher than average temperature. So the pink bars represent one standard deviation above the average temperature. We see that these increases in May, and then what I didn't show, but similarly increases above the baseline in August are also associated with these warmer temperatures. For PM 2.5, you see a decrease in PM 2.5, again, in the sort of peak reductions of transportation emissions, but you also see that these reductions are associated with cooler weather. Again, so now we're one standard devi deviation or more below the average. And these, these are also associated with precipitation events. We also see that later in September, there's a huge increase in PM 2.5 above the baseline. And that of course is due to wildfires. We can also look at model results and see that this machine learning model captures the correlation between high ozone concentrations shown here in red and higher temperatures across a range of NOx, uh, NOx levels. And this model was trained on data from 2018, excuse me, 2014 to 2018. If we look now at the daily eight hour ozone, we see increases above the 2020 baseline, excuse me, the 2017 to 2019 baseline, that is the blue trace, the 2020 is the red trace in Pasadena. So increases of up to 30% in late April and up to 19% in late March. Interestingly, it, more inland, we actually saw decreases relative to the historical baseline of ozone this tells us that there's also an influence of chemistry. It's not just emissions and meteorology. So here we're sharing these findings of the virtual study team and other colleagues and communities that really highlight that emissions don't equal pollutant levels. I think we're reminded here that air quality and climate are inextricably linked and we must think about observing systems, multi-scale models and mitigation strategies that allow concerted action. I wanna thank you for your attention and leave you with the list of presentations that cover similar topics, but in greater detail. Thank you. I'm Alex Turner. And today I'm gonna to talk about some work from the Beacon Project at UC Berkeley, led by Professor Ron Cohen's group that was recently published in GRL. Specifically, I'll be talking about our work using a dense, low cost network to observe CO2 emission changes induced by the COVID-19 global pandemic. The work I'll talk about today is going to focus on the San Francisco Bay Area, and this background image is the Bay Bridge in San Francisco. I find it striking because it's totally empty, like many of the roads were during the peak of the shelter-in-place orders. The question we aimed to address was, what are the effects of shelter-in-place orders due to COVID-19 on urban CO2 emissions? San Francisco is an ideal city to examine, as it was the first city in the United States to implement such a shelter-in-place order. And the order was enacted on March 16th, 2020, or about 268 days ago. Because it was the first city in the U.S. to enact such an order, we might expect the most abrupt response here. Now, before I get into the specifics of the changes observed during COVID-19, I wanted to talk about how we actually go about estimating emissions. And there are two methods that I'll briefly discuss, the bottom-up method and the top-down method. The bottom-up method can be thought of as an accounting method. We take some activity data, such as the map of traffic density and emission factors, like the CO2 emitted per car, and the product of the two gives us a map of CO2 emissions from traffic. This method is great because it relates the CO2 emissions to the underlying processes driving those emissions. However, it requires a lot of detailed information at high spatial resolution and requires assumptions about how representative those emission factors are. In contrast, the top-down method attempts to back out the most likely set of emissions given a set of atmospheric observations. This cartoon on the right gives a simplified schematic of how this works. Briefly, we use a transport model to simulate what our measurements should see and then scale the emissions so they best fit the observations. This top-down method is often used in conjunction with the bottom-up method. Or that is to say, we use the bottom-up as a starting point and then try to find where the bottom-up is over or underestimating emissions based on the atmospheric measurements. Our group has spent quite a bit of time putting together what we think is the best bottom-up estimate of urban CO2 emissions in the San Francisco Bay Area. In a moment, this animation on the left will show what our emissions look like. 
The top row shows a spatial map of the emissions over the region, and the left panel is our entire domain, while the right panel is zoomed in on the San Francisco Bay Area. The bottom row shows the emissions from different uh, sectors over a week in March 2020. Black is the total emissions, orange is traffic, purple are stationary anthropogenic sources, green is the biosphere, and the background shading indicates daytime and nighttime. Our biosphere estimate comes from measurements of solar-induced chlorophyll fluorescence, or SIF, from the Tropomi satellite. Not surprisingly, we see large uptake of carbon from plants during the middle of the day. The important point here is that the biosphere estimate is not simply a prediction from a model, but actually constrained by measurements. We also see a daily cycle in the traffic emissions, and this comes from a high-resolution traffic inventory that was put together by Brian McDonald, who's at NOAA. The emissions from traffic can, can be clearly seen in the top right panel as the purple lines. Putting it all together, we see a sawtooth-like pattern in the daily cycle of CO2 emissions over the Bay Area, with the biosphere offsetting much of the midday emissions from traffic, and structural differences between weekday and weekend emissions in the Bay Area. So our aim here is to improve on this bottom-up estimate shown on the left using our atmospheric observations from the Beacon Network. The Beacon Network was established in 2013, and the aim was to blanket a city with low-cost sensors. Our instruments include measurements of CO2, CO, NO, NO2, ozone, and PM, but for this work I'm focusing just on CO2. We currently have more than 70 sensors around the San Francisco Bay Area, and of those, 35 sites were operational during the beginning of the shelter-in-place order in spring 2020. And the image on the left shows the location of those 35 sensors that were operational during this period. What I'm showing here are the measurements from all the beacon nodes from January to July 2020 on the top as different colors, and the number of active sites on the bottom panel. Our group did some site maintenance on the network at the beginning of the year and rather fortuitously got many of the sites back online in mid-February before COVID-19 shutdowns occurred. The gray bar indicates the first week of shelter in place, and for this work, I'm gonna focus on two time periods, six weeks before shelter in place and six weeks during the order. What I'm showing here is the median CO2 concentration across the network before shelter in place in purple and during shelter in place in green. Some of the most notable differences are in the middle of the week, uh, particularly in the morning and evening rush hour. For example, on Wednesday morning, we see about a 50 ppm difference between the before and during shelter in place order. However, some of this difference could simply be due to changes in the biosphere or meteorology. So what we're seeing is a clear decrease in CO2 concentrations but still begs the question, how much of this is actually attributable to emissions changes? All right, now we're gonna try and estimate CO2 fluxes using those beacon measurements. Our goal is to estimate hourly CO2 fluxes at 900 meter resolution across the San Francisco Bay Area during COVID-19. To do this, we're gonna use Bayesian inference, and we'll walk through a couple terms in this expression here. The first term is XA, or the prior emissions. In our case, it's the bottom-up inventory I showed earlier, and here's a panel from that figure. So this will be our starting point. Y is our measurements. In this case, we'll be using those six weeks of observations before and during shelter in place. And H is the footprint matrix. This matrix encapsulates all of the atmospheric transport. So the way we construct this is using the STILT model or the stochastic time inverted Lagrangian transport model. In short, what we do is we advect 1,000 particles 72 hours backwards in time using meteorology from the NOAA High Resolution Rapid Refresh to see where those uh, particles came from. And we do this for every measurement, and we can use these back trajectories to determine the region our measurements are sensitive to. So what I'm plotting on the left is the cumulative sensitivity, uh, so dark colors indicate a stronger network sensitivity, and the whites mean that uh, these areas have little influence on our uh, measurements that we make in the atmosphere. Zooming in on the San Francisco Bay Area, we can see the strongest sensitivities occur in the vicinity of our instruments, which makes sense. And this white line I've shown in the right panel encapsulates the top 40 percentile of the network sensitivity. We consider this region to be the region that we can actually constrain with our measurements due to the high sensitivity. This is important because as you can see in the equation above, the posterior solution will simply revert to those prior emissions, XA, in the regions of low sensitivity. So while we would obtain a solution, it would simply reflect the bottom up, not the measurements, whereas we have confidence in the observed changes within this white region. All right, now I'll move on to the results and show the CO2 fluxes inferred from our measurements. Here I'm showing the spatial patterns of the posterior fluxes before shelter in place on the left, 
and during shelter in place on the right. We're strongly sensitive to the East Bay and the hatched areas indicate regions of low sensitivity, as I mentioned. We do see changes in the biosphere from the hatched areas, and those changes are actually constrained by satellite measurements of SIF from Tropomi. Most of our measurements are weakly sensitive to the biosphere, with the exception of the north shore of Richmond that I pointed out with Fierro, where we do see a dominant biosphere signal in the urban area. This panel on the right shows a true color image from Landsat, where we can see vegetation dominating the coastline here. This second arrow points out the Chevron refinery in Richmond, California, and highlights some of the complexity of sources in the San Francisco Bay Area that we seem to be resolving in our uh, posterior fluxes. Uh, you can see both the biosphere and the Chevron refinery in those posterior fluxes on the left. The panel on the right shows the difference between the two time periods. We observe large changes over the urban core and crucial commuter freeways, such as I-880, that goes north-south along the western shore. So the data suggests that the changes in urban emissions are driving much of the differences in our atmospheric measurements. We can also look at the temporal changes in the CO2 fluxes. The panel on the right shows the CO2 fluxes before shelter in place, and we're finding large CO2 emissions from traffic in orange that coincide with the morning rush during the middle of the week. This is not simply driven by our prior emissions, and it's notably absent from the weekend. The bottom panel shows the same thing, but for the time period during shelter in place. We see a 30% decrease in the fossil fuel emissions, with most of this coming from traffic and a small change from stationary anthropogenic sources. Two particularly interesting findings are the changes to the diurnal patterns. We no longer see those large rush hour emissions, and the nighttime emissions show a dramatic decrease. This is pointing to a major shift in both when and where our CO2 emissions are coming from. Finally, we also see a much more active biosphere, which highlights the importance of measure using measurements to constrain that signal. In summary, we're finding a 30% decrease in urban CO2 emissions in response to COVID-19 mobility restrictions that is primarily driven by traffic. These findings were only possible because of the dense sensor network employed here, and it really highlights the power of being able to get to these high spatial resolution patterns and separate the different sources. Finally, this work provides a glimpse into a world with reduced emissions from an electrified vehicle fleet. I've also included a few additional details about the inversion here, and feel free to contact me uh, at the email address provided or check out the GRL paper. Thanks. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk about this exciting research project here. Uh, first, I'm Eric Court. I'm a professor at the University of Michigan. I'll be speaking today on behalf of a broad team uh, of scientists across Jet Propulsion Lab and University of Arizona, uh, named here. Uh, I want to comment that this project, it arose out of this Keck Institute for Space Studies workshop. Uh, and we were fortunate enough that we were able to get support from NASA to conduct the research flights I'm going to discuss. So we're thankful to both KISS and NASA for their support. Uh, and then I also want to comment that the results are all preliminary, so they are subject to change. So with that out of the way, uh, I wanted today to really talk about the study where we wanted to understand how the response to the COVID-19 pandemic could have impacted methane emissions in California. So the initial motivation here was really to try to directly observe changes in oil and gas methane emissions to understand control and processes. We know that 2020 brought about large and unprecedented economic and human stress to the entire oil and gas supply chain. Uh, this involved competing and unknown effects on methane emissions. We know there's a large oil price crash and decrease in production. There could have been an emissions decrease. Maintenance reductions could have led to emissions increases. Some environmental reporting was relaxed. There's some bankruptcies, abandoned wells. All of these could have impacted emissions. We don't really know how much they actually changed emissions. So we argue that we really need to characterize these changes to know how inputs to the Earth system are changing and to understand how changes in human actions change emissions. So without having these observations now, we would be forced to speculate. And I emphasize that we can think of this as a process level study of the human component of the Earth system to really understand how, as we change pressures on the human component here, how that changes emissions. And we had an opportunity in California because we can make observations of methane plumes with the average next-gen instrument in California rapidly. And we already have baseline observations with that instrument from the California Methane Survey. So we should be able to robustly detect and attribute any changes we observe to changes caused by the COVID-19 response. 
what do those baseline observations look like? And, and why do these targeted high resolution airborne measurements help us? I'm showing a figure here. This is from Miley Duran's paper on the methane baseline survey, showing the percentage of total emissions on the y axis, point source emissions on the x. It's log scale on the x axis. And the red here is showing California. So this is the baseline survey. Every dot is a different point source and a different emissions magnitude. This is a highly skewed emissions. There's this heavy tail where the high level of emissions contribute disproportionately to total emissions. Something like more than 50% of the emissions are these relatively small number of sites over say 500 kilograms an hour. This nature of distribution, which we can discover by flying an instrument like Avros Next Gen, where we get plume images, like this shows example plume images, where we can quantify these point source emissions. Here's a plume image of an oil wells methane emissions. Uh, we can build up these distributions, and then we can understand that if there's any shift in this distribution, particularly at the high end, it's gonna have disproportionately large impacts on methane emissions. So since we have this so, such well-characterized distribution for California, we can go back, we can we know our flight patterns, we can measure these same regions and domains, and we can characterize if there's any shift in this distribution and try to better link that then to what the process cause might be. And so we can really only do this by going back with, with the average next gen instrument. This shows some of the sample flight plans. We decided we wanted to try to focus primarily uh, on the energy sector. And that's showed with red boxes here. A lot of this is in Kern County. We'll come back to that soon. Uh, we also did flights on dairies as well as uh, waste, which is largely landfills. And the idea here was to do multiple revisits so we could assess persistence and to cover about half of the previous California baseline survey sites. This is what it actually looked like. So here's the baseline survey on the left. You can see vast areas covered from 2016 to 2017. And here's the COVID study where we had flights from July through September with much more targeted regions focusing on revisits on significant oil and gas, dairy and landfill emissions with a particular focus kind of in the Southern half of California. We're gonna really focus on Kern County today for a number of reasons. So Kern County is this region right here. Uh, the re reason to focus on Kern County is both because this is a major oil and gas production region in California, and because this is where we primarily focus our initial plume processing. So all of these black dots show plumes from the methane baseline survey, and orange show plumes from the COVID study. We are still processing plumes in the COVID study, so it's an incomplete list of dots of orange. That's part of the difference that you see here. By focusing in Kern County, we can have a statistically robust conversation about how oil and gas emissions have evolved and changed. So what are the changes we might expect in Kern County? Well, we know that the COVID period brought about reduced oil production and some shut-in for operators. Uh, there's reduced upstream activity, but less of a change in gas production than midstream. And if we compare gas production uh, and oil production from roughly our time period of flights to the CalMethane survey, there was reductions of about 14% for gas and 33% for oil. So we saw reductions in production, um, not huge reductions, but notable reductions. And so we might expect emissions might have shifted in similar magnitudes. That could be one hypothesis. These are what the plumes look like. So this was in the cover slide. So this is from the COVID study. This is shown one specific facility and it shows one specific overflight, what a methane plume looks like being emitted from this facility. And so this is what we do is we fly over, we see these images, and I'm going to discuss both plumes, which is considering every individual plume we see, but I'm also going to discuss sites and emissions. And in that case, we actually overfly over many days, many times, and we can evaluate persistence of the plume. So then we can actually do a quantification of emissions, taking into account that some plumes might be intermittent. So what did we find? So in Kern County, if we consider the oil and gas, we have similar sampling. In the baseline study, we found about 385 plumes. COVID period, 259 plumes. So we saw a reduction in the number of plumes. I'll comment blue is always going to be baseline and red is going to be the COVID period. We saw higher emissions per plume. So this shows the plume emissions, box and whisker plots, in the COVID period and the baseline. You see the median and the whole distribution is shifted higher in the COVID period compared to the baseline period. If we consider a cumulative emissions curve, 100% of emissions here log scale, you see it's a similar type of distribution, 
baseline and then the COVID period, but there's a shift and it's a slightly steeper distribution. So there's a shift to the right. You see fewer plumes, but there's higher emissions per plume. If we consider persistence and get towards emissions, we find a similar story with quantification here. In the baseline period, we saw about 12,500 kilograms an hour, 281 sites, COVID, 7,500, 115 sites. Higher emissions per site, again, box and whiskers higher in COVID than in the baseline with this shifted steeper distribution. So what does this mean? We saw 40% the number of source sites, but 60% of the total emissions. So we saw a very drastic reduction in the number of source sites, dropped down to 40%, but the emissions did not fall commensurately. There was a shift towards higher emission sites, and so we saw higher emissions than one might have expected from the reduction in the number of sites. Now, it turns out this is not uniform across Kern County. This is uh, showing gas produced across Kern County. There's gas and oil produced there. And we isolate three different regions here, the Northwest, the West, and the Northeast, which represent high gas production, medium gas production, and quite low gas production. We can just quickly consider how these different domains look. In the Western Kern region, we saw about 3,000 kilograms on the baseline study and about 3,800 in the COVID period, a shift towards higher emissions per site, 10% reduction in number of sites, 30% increase in emissions. We see an even more extreme change in the Northeast Kern region, where we see only 20% the number of sources, 19 compared to 90 sites, but we see 50% the emissions, 1,500 to 3,000 kilograms, a large shift towards higher emitters, even though there's a drastic reduction in the number of emitters. In the Northwest, we saw actually proportional changes. So this was different. We saw that about 60% the number of sources and about 60% the emissions. No notable shift in the distribution here. So it's different in this domain. So what are we learning from all of this? Well, for oil and gas in California, we appear to see a steepening of the cumulative emissions curve. There's fewer sites with higher average emissions. It's non-uniform across production regions, some modest changes, some drastic reductions in emissions, number of emission sites, but not very drastic drops in emissions. We have ongoing work to better identify the process explanation. This non-uniformity is helpful if we start to look at these different regions and see how the emissions behaviors shift and how different activities shift, we can better understand and link what has caused more drastic drop in emissions versus drastic drop in sites. We have ongoing work to better investigate landfills and dairy. And I'll finish with one broad conclusion thought. The changes wrought by COVID forces on Kern County oil and gas are really an inefficient and ineffective means towards mitigating emissions. With that, thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions in the Q&A. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about the global air quality response to the COVID-19 pandemic. First of all, I want to thank all the co-authors who really contributed uh, greatly to the content and the ideas that you're going to see today. Now, if you think about the COVID-19, we can just sort of think of it as a kind of viral butterfly effect drawing from chaos theory. We're starting about with, a, an, with an infection that occurred in a wholesale market in, in Wuhan, China, and this quickly spread, impacting everyone's lives globally. Now that spread resulted in a number of uh, government lockdowns starting in January 23rd, and they extended globally. And one of the ways of quantifying that is with something called the Oxford Stringency Index. And you can see that uh, China started in that January 23rd period uh, in that transition. And then the other countries such as the United States and Germany came in a little bit later uh, in mid-March. Now, those um, stringency indexes and those lockdowns affected activity. And perhaps one of the most uh, activities that was most profoundly affected was uh, airline uh, traffic. And so here's an example of this airline traffic from SF and uh, Los Angeles Airport. And you can see that right around mid-March, um, mid this activity dropped like a rock, uh, no pun intended. Uh, down to 20% of its baseline. That's a severe drop in activity. Now, these changes in activities also means you're changing emissions. And if you're changing emissions, you're also changing pollution. And the question is, what was the impact on global air quality? And that's a really important question because air quality itself 
is a driver of global mortality. In fact, it is the fifth highest mortality risk factor and is associated with about 5 million deaths. But its impact is regionally distinct. So the question is, what was that impact regionally? And to unpack that, we're going to look at three particular regions. One is Los Angeles. The other one is uh, Lima, Peru. And the, and the third one is Shanghai, China. Now, one of the best ways to sort of get in a first cut at what changes in air quality are is looking at NO2. And tropomy NO2 has been a fantastic instrument for that purpose. What you're looking at here is uh, NO2 concentrations in 2019 and 2020. Um, the dashed line is uh, before and after the lockdowns. And you can see quite clearly that 2020, you're seeing lower NO2 concentrations in each one of these cities than in 2019. But the specific time series is quite a bit different. So in order to understand the relationship between the concentrations we're seeing and the underlying emissions and subsequent um, pollution, we have to consider three factors. First, we need to understand the meteorological context, uh, temperature, precipitation, winds, the anthropogenic context, that is the em emission seasonality at the sectoral distribution, the lockdown approach, and finally, the chemical context, that is the balance of precursor concentrations. We know, for example, um, depending on uh, the amount of NO2 and ambient VOCs, that reductions of NO2 could actually lead to increases in ozone, but also on a different chemical regime can lead to reductions in ozone. So in order to capture all three of these factors, we're gonna use a multi-constituent chemical data simulation system, uh, uh, JPL, this sim assimilation system brings together satellites such as Tropomi NO2, but also CO from Moppet, uh, New Air's own ozone products, to estimate NOx, CO, and SO2 emissions in subsequent uh, chemical pol uh, pollution. In doing that, we're able to get a number of very powerful diagnostics that helps us understand the relationships to emissions and concentrations. And one of those is here. Uh, this is the ozone production efficiency, which is the amount of ozone produced for a certain amount of NOx emissions. And what's remarkable is the wide range of production efficiency from the tropics, which is the highest, to uh, the extra tropics where it's the lowest. And that's a var that vary varies by almost an order of magnitude. But in the extra tropics, that variation also has substantial variability seasonally. In fact, it increases by an order of magnitude from February to June. And that's a consequence of the fact of increased photochemical production as we go into the summertime. That information is critical for understanding the ozone response, which here you can see uh, is particularly centered, uh, for example, over in Africa in the Nigerian region, in India and in Southeast Asia, as well as in Mexico. But further up in the free troposphere, you're seeing a substantially increase in, a decrease in ozone by over three parts per million. And that has substantial implications for long range transport and climate. Now, in addition to ozone, there are also changes in aerosols. One of those is secondary inorganic aerosol formation, which can be calculated by a combination of nitrates, sulfates, and ammonium. We're gonna look at this in April over the United States. We used uh, two different cases. One is a business as usual NOx emissions. And the second one is uh, NOx emissions reduced during COVID-19 from the chemical data simulation system. And you can see here that the differences are really substantial in Los Angeles and in the Central Valley and to a lesser extent across the Midwest, even though what we're seeing is much more localized reductions in NOx emissions. And the question is why? We can study that by looking at uh, the gas ratio. Now, this is a metric of nitrate uh, production uh, sensitivity. And this gas, gas ratio has been calculated for both the business as usual, which is shown here on the left. And you can see very high gas ratios in um, California and in Idaho and the Midwest. And then uh, you can see those gas ratios going up under COVID-19 NOx emissions calculated from the chemical data simulation. Now, when that happens, you're, you're shifting towards a more NOx sensitive regime. And you can see that very clearly in the difference. So that magnitude in California really goes up uh, under the reduced NOx emissions, which means you had higher um, aerosol production efficiencies, which lead, led to lower reductions. So in final, the mitigation of, of 
COVID-19 transmission, the, the flattening of the curve has led to global but regionally distinct reductions in pollutants caused by meteorology, emissions, and chemical regimes. Now, the ozone production efficiency varied by over an order of magnitude in megacities, and those were particularly dominated by the tropics. And this suggests equatorward shifts in emissions in the future will have greater impacts on pollution. Now, in North America, reductions in secondary inorganic production of aerosols from NOx emissions exceeded five micrograms per meter cubed, and those were mostly centered in, in, in Southern California. And that was a consequence not only of the reductions in NOx emissions, but also in the increase in nitrate production efficiency. Finally, the COVID-19 mitigation represents an, an impressive scenario of opportunity to test how future sector reductions could occur and thus may inform future pollution and climate mitigation strategies. Thank you very much for your time. Hi, everybody. I'm going to talk to you about the KISS study's uh, analysis of the impacts on the global carbon cycle. Here are the carbonators, the smiling faces of the people who participated in this group, including folks with atmospheric, ocean, land uh, foci, um, Eric Court, who linked us in to the airborne experiments. And uh, this, this group um, really came together to look at the global carbon cycle and the impacts of the pandemic on it in a unique way. As background, uh, we looked at the impact of previous socioeconomic uh, events on the global carbon cycle. And uh, this figure shows the 1970s oil crisis, the Iranian revolution, the collapse of the former Soviet Union, even the dot-com bubble, and the financial crisis. And you can see that many of the, these events are associated with significant changes to the growth rate of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as a result of large-scale impacts on the economy manifesting themselves in energy production and consumption. So it, it seemed reasonable even at the very outset of the pandemic that there might be substantial effects on the global carbon cycle. And that, that those effects might be manifest not only in changes to emissions, um, but those changes in the growth rate of CO2 might also manifest themselves as uh, changes in land or ocean feedbacks. Um, this is our, our team figure. Um, uh, in the case of the carbon cycle, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic led to reductions in human activities, particularly in the transportation sector. That very much affected the amount of CO2 being used by cars, trucks, uh, public transportation in urban areas, and all in all led to really quite substantial reductions in the emissions of carbon dioxide. Um, and some of what we learn from observing the chain of cause and effect from the, from the pandemic all the way through to the global atmosphere informs us not only about how the Earth system works, but also what mitigation look like, might look like and uh, how we might use observing systems to detect and quantify the success uh, or lack of success of any given mitigation approach. Working together with, with colleagues, in particular Zhu Liu, um, we used data from uh, very high resolution estimates of emissions at, at daily time scales. And you can see in these figures the really quite dramatic reductions in daily CO2 emissions um, beginning in, uh, re relative, I should say, to 2019. Um, with the onset of the pandemic. Now these reduction emissions, reductions in emissions didn't occur simultaneously. Um, they were phased over the course of the globe. And so in order to examine their impact at the global scale, it's very important to follow the phasing uh, beginning in Asia, Europe, North America, and the Southern Hemisphere. We used those emissions together with baseline emissions. We used the emission reductions together with a baseline estimate of global emissions to simulate what the effects of these sort of 10 to 30% reduction in urban emissions uh, 
might look like as they were transported into the global atmosphere. And Leslie Ott's team at NASA Goddard used the GIAS model to simulate this and eventually um, to simulate what the COVID impacts would look like at Mauna Loa. And um, I want to you know, kind of jump to the punchline here. The effects of these rather substantial regional and local emissions when integrated into the global atmosphere are barely discernible at the Mauna Loa station, at least based on these simulations. Um, first of all, uh, the emissions are against a very high baseline. Uh, second of all, most of the emissions were in a limited number of sectors and didn't address primary energy, electricity, so that um, in, you know, in, in many parts of the world outside of dense population centers, the emissions were only modestly reduced. And, and finally, these reductions have to be seen against the background of 150 years or more of accumulated emissions into the atmosphere. Those emissions are also buffered by the oceans. And one of our team members has shown that you know, even the very subtle concentration changes are rather rapidly reflected in ocean uptake or release of carbon dioxide so that the effects of the emission reductions are further reduced by Earth system feedbacks. I want to just wrap up this quick presentation by talking about what we learned about mitigation, that these significant behavioral changes and major sacrifices did reduce urban emissions, and these emissions are discernible. The global and local case studies document this in detail, but these major behavioral changes produced only a modest decline in global emissions reducing emissions back to approximately 1999 levels. So uh, moving us back two decades or so um, in terms of uh, annual emissions. Despite this, the change to global CO2, which is the metric for the impact of carbon dioxide on climate, barely changed. And um, you know, we, we would note that mitigation focusing on individual behavior, for example, choices about driving, um, how often you get your dry cleaning done and so on, is really not an effective way of generating climate significant emission reductions. And any procedure like that really needs uh, very much to also affect primary energy manufacturing and large scale transportation. Thank you very much. I want to begin by acknowledging the trauma of this past year. Enormous numbers of people have suffered as a result of the pandemic. And Losses of life and income have been widespread, but not equally shared, of course. The most vulnerable among us uh, have been the hardest hit. So there's certainly no uh, silver lining at all to what has happened. And as we have heard in the previous presentations, the decline in economic activity has significantly reduced the emissions of many gases to the atmosphere. And these changes have in turn impacted global air quality and climate forcing. And of course, these emission reductions occur at a time when we have unprecedented observations, both from the ground and from space, that will label, enable us to learn about the response of our planet to these changes. And while we will use these data in a sophisticated analysis to try to disentangle all the processes that, that are at play, I think we can conclude already from what we have seen that misery is just no solution to our global environmental challenges. And in the next few slides, I'd like to explain uh, that point of view and point towards what I think the true path forward is. In a recently published analysis uh, by Xu Liu and colleagues, we can see that the economic disruptions in 2020 are really without parallel in the last half century. These changes, though, have been very sector dependent. And so we can see that these large, the large reductions in transportation related um, emissions from both ground transportation and especially uh, aviation, where the emissions dropped enormously. These impacts have been and are really heterogeneous, though, both in time and in space. Even within a single city, such as Los Angeles here, we can see that the across the city, 
um, in the more wealthy regions of the, of, of the county, um, people really stopped driving. Whereas to the east, where most of the service wet, uh, workers had been pushed by the high housing costs of the basin, uh, continued to drive. We now have, of course, a number of new sensors, such as Tropomi, that allow us to image these changes in, the, in traffic emissions. This is images actually from the predecessor, OMI, and we can see just how large these reductions in uh, 2020 were for this, in this case, the NO2 concentrations. But we have to think about the much longer term context for the 2020 changes. So what's shown in this figure is just the emissions uh, or actually the column amount, amounts of NO2 from 2005 and 2013. So we can see that there have been over the last several decades, just enormous reductions in NOx. And of course these come because of the, um, the invention of the catalytic converter, which cleaned up the air long before the pandemic. In addition, of course, there were emissions controls uh, that were invented for use on power plants. And so together these have led to an enormous improvement in air quality. Ari Hagenschmidt shown here on the right uh, was the, the Caltech chemist who uh, really figured out the mechanism for smog formation in Los Angeles. He showed that it came largely from the automobile section. And as a result, by, in, by putting uh, emissions control systems on the, the, um, the automobiles, we saw a huge drop in the pollution within the basin. Again, there was no uh, pandemic or no misery that caused this. This was the result of policy and invention. Remarkably, if we look at the CO2 emissions now um, from 2020, despite the enormous uh, um, impacts on transportation, they're only a few percent lower than if nothing had happened at all. That's the top line here. We can see that out projecting into the future along the steps um, uh, emissions pathway, we expect that the emissions will recover and continue at these very high levels. So not surprising given the very small reductions in CO2 emissions, atmospheric CO2 continues to increase as if almost nothing happened. Shown here in a figure courtesy of Zhengji Liu is uh, OCO2 uh, observations made over the oceans in the Northern hemisphere, that's the black line. And in the Southern hemisphere, that's the red line here. If we remove the seasonal cycle, we get the lower uh, figures and what we can see is if we look at the pandemic period of 2020, that the CO2 increases almost did not notice. And of course, the temperature of our planet continues to warm. This year, the temperatures, global temperatures are one degree warmer than they were in the early 20th century. So to keep the planet from boiling, we need an enormous reduction in CO2 emissions, nothing that a pandemic will give us. If we want to get to net zero by 2070, we need to follow the upper pathways here. If we want to get to net zero by 2050, we're going to have enormous reductions in the amount of, of carbon uh, that's emitted to the atmosphere. But you know, we can actually do this. The costs of generating electricity in a carbon-free pathway are well within hand now. In fact, within a few years, it's going to be more expensive to run existing fossil fuel powered power plants than it will be to generate electricity in CO2 non-emitting ways. These pathways are in hand. And in fact, what's amazing is that um, currently, the projects with low cost financing, that is to say with strong policy support that can tap high quality resources, solar PV is now the cheapest source of electricity in history. So this is not a pipe dream. In California, 
emissions from power generation are falling quickly. So the lessons of 2020 that I take away are simply that human misery is no solution to our global environmental challenges. We have wonderful new sensors that will enable to test our understanding of how the emission changes have altered air pollution and climate. We can learn about how do changes in NOx alter ozone and particulate in cities as diverse as Los Angeles and Karachi. We can learn how aircraft changes uh, upper atmospheric cloudiness. How do aerosols alter the reflectivity of the planet more generally? And how do the reductions in carbon dioxide influence the global carbon cycle? But what we really need um, is to reform and quickly um, reduce the amount of emissions from all of the human activities. We need inventions. We need engineering and policy support for low carbon technologies so that we can power our transportation with electricity because it is better and cheaper than using. We will generate that electricity with solar, wind, and nuclear because it is cleaner. And we will generate electricity with solar and wind because it is cheaper. So the takeaway here is that we need to invent, we need to advocate, we need to engineer, and we need to vote. We have done it before, we can do it again, and that's the lesson I take away from this past year. Good morning, everyone. So we're uh, now live. First of all, I want to thank all of the speakers who contributed to the session. Um, and, and unfortunately, because of technical limitations, we're not able to have everyone on screen at the same time. Uh, so Dave and Paul and I are gonna attempt to answer some questions uh, that sort of um, integrate across the different talks. Um, but thank you for joining us for the session and, and thank you again to all the speakers. So the first question that I have um, for Dave and Paul is, um, in these talks that, that we just showed, for the most part, we talked about changes in greenhouse gases and air quality separately. And um, I'd like you to sort of address what we've learned about the intersection of the two from the COVID event. Dave, why don't you take the first stab at that? Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good. Um, I, I think that one of the most powerful observations is, is the correlation between the emissions that you can see in the various data sources between the greenhouse gases and the air pollution gases. They're, they're not coming from identically the same sources, but since the majority of reductions were in transportation, you can see the correlated reductions. So when we think about mitigation strategies, we really need to think about addressing air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions in an integrated systemic way. Now we didn't learn very much about the coordinated emissions from primary energy, from electricity production and manufacturing, because those were affected to a much lesser degree by, as Paul called it, human misery. Thanks, Dave. Um, um, Paul, what do you, yeah, do you have something to add? Well, the only thing, can you hear me? Yeah. No, yeah. The only thing I would add really is uh, we didn't focus on the aviation sector per se. And it's another area I think that's uh, really fascinating and will be interesting to see the follow up studies. You know, um, there, there has been and is a lot of suggestion that perhaps as much as half of the climate impact of aviation is due to high level cirrus. And uh, we just really haven't, um, there's been no such study that I've seen yet uh, addressing whether what we thought based mostly on models um, 
is is true. So I'm 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 interested to see more about the aviation sector's impact. Of course, it is the the most rapidly growing, um, the most rapidly growing sector that is very very hard to mitigate in terms of uh, switch over to to non carbon emissions. Yeah, for me, I think um, one of the the interesting things that's come up is this question about what happened with methane and and the fact that you know we seem to have at least in California fewer emitters but more uh, relative emissions and and methane really plays that intermediary role to me between a climate gas and an air quality gas and um, some of the work that we've done has pointed to you know the changes in um, OH radicals resulting from the changes in, in NOx reductions, and then and then that that has this you know interesting feedback with the methane lifetime, and so um, so to me I think getting a better handle on what happened with methane during the pandemic is really going to help bridge that question of you know what was the impact on climate versus the impact on air quality and and how do we develop mitigation strategies that that address both at the same time. So, um, so the next question that I had, um, and and you know, this, we don't we don't have a lot of time, um, so I, I just wanted to ask though, what did you guys find to be the most surprising or interesting thing that you've learned about the Earth system from the COVID nineteen event? What really has stuck out to you? And um, Dave, why don't you take that one first again? <laughs> That, that's actually a very hard question to answer. <laughs> and, and the reason is that so many things were stunning about the whole event, the global magnitude, the rate at which it came uh, into effect. There, <clears throat> there are a couple of things that, that I think scientifically emerged in our study one of course was the the variation in the impact of air pollution precursors depending on the chemical and meteorological environment the fact that these very large reductions had differential effects in different parts of the world another very important result was the almost immediate feedback from ocean uptake on the change in carbon dioxide, that the chemical mechanism is so fine-tuned that even the quite small changes to concentrations and the growth rate probably were modulated in the Earth's system by the oceans and possibly by the biosphere as well. So those are very important scientific findings that help us as we think in the future about how mitigation will work, um, and also about how mitigation's effectiveness might be detected by observations in order to manage the transition. Uh, Jessica, we only have a minute left, and so maybe maybe you want to answer that question that you asked of us. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think I think. The most interesting thing for me was really being able to um, observe the differences in ozone production efficiency around the world. That that we could see, you know, that um, even though the southern hemisphere and the tropics had smaller, um, uh, you know, NOx reductions associated with the COVID lockdowns, that those had an outsized impact on the global tropospheric ozone burden and and that that this ozone efficient you know ozone production efficiency that we all talk about and and has been observed you know at small scales and modeled um, but to really observe it at a large scale across the globe and those differences in ozone production efficiency for me that was the sort of the most interesting thing um, I showed that we have a, a few a few or maybe one minute left so Paul do you want to take a stab at it um, I think the the question that that this whole year leaves me with is just a sense of how much of what 
uh, we've discovered about doing things um, differently uh, sticks. You know, I, I'm really curious to see whether um, whether and how human behavior uh, does change and will change um, in the future. You know, just look at us here on this stupid Zoom AGU thing. Um, and uh, you know, is this is this our future, or what hybrid are we going to have? And I think I think uh, it, it's going to be a, a really fascinating uh, human experiment that we're doing right now to see what uh, what the lasting impacts of of this year have been. All right, thank you. I show that we're out of time, so um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us, and we hope you enjoyed the session.